So today we have Dr. Ipsa Jain with us. She is from Srishti Manipal Institute of Art, Design and Technology here in Bangalore. She did her BSc and MSc in Zoology from University of Delhi and her PhD in Biological Sciences from IISC Bangalore. She has worked in various places, including a postdoc from the Institute of Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine. Her current area of practice is science communication and illustration. She has been involved in various creative practice and outreach efforts. Today, she has a talk for us titled Unlabbing Science, where she'll be sharing her experiences of how to conduct experiments in cellular biology when one doesn't have access to sophisticated lab. Okay something different <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so much arishi and thank you uh, to the summer school for inviting me here yeah I've, it's just been great to see the energy that you've been putting in the exercises that have been put across you um so most of the introduction was correct just the last part i don't in fact even think about how to do cell biology experiments outside i do think about how do we imagine science in public spaces? And I will talk about that briefly uh, a little later. Um, so uh, I call my talk Unlabbing Science and hopefully through the projects that I share, the idea of what unlabbing means will become clear, at least in the way I imagine it. Um, and like Arushi mentioned, I started uh, as a run of the mill scientist pursuing a PhD um, and then at some point, uh, point, moved from being a scientist to being a science communicator. Now, this is also a word that I have only very recently become comfortable with using when trying to identify myself. Um, what really happened was that in 2016, I dropped the pipette, which is what molecular biologists use, if you don't know, maybe you do know, um, and picked up a pencil. And pencil became my tool of choice because I was not great with words. and. Uh, and I think I still am not, uh, which you will realize as I speak and share. Uh, uh, in, and in these last six and seven years, I have made a lot of images and have contributed even to moving images, which is to say we animated videos and movies. Uh, I've illustrated for magazine websites and conferences and blogs <clears throat> and books. And I have some of my work here, which I will encourage you to come and look at uh, once I'm done with the monologue, monologue part of this entire exercise. Um, I've even created my own merchandise and done about a bit of other work. Uh, but uh, seven years is a long time to then think about what is it that I've been able to do and uh, where is it that I stand. So um, uh, last year, um, I asked myself, am I still a scientist? Uh, because I often write scientist turned science communicator and you know, identity is a big thing with at least my generation and I suppose also with your generation, what is the label that you give yourself? Um, <clears throat> so I was at TFR Hyderabad and uh, asking people uh, to make zines and I sat with them and made a zine myself, which is here, which you can check out later, which uh, is titled, Am I Still a Scientist? The still is in brackets. Um, so I start with a definition of what is a scientist. I don't know if it was from Wikipedia or some other dictionary, I don't remember the source. It says a person who is studying or has expert knowledge of one or more of the natural or physical sciences, which eventually will apply to you if you don't feel that it applies to you already. Um, uh, but I looked at the verbs and it said studying and I was like, hmm, do I study anymore? Uh, maybe not. Uh, it says expert knowledge, I was like, I'm not an expert really, and I've forgotten so much. Um, the word natural science is still sort of is something that I connect with. And I said, I'm still curious and I ask questions. Uh, I ask questions which start with what, how, why, where. Um, and then the biggest question that I asked in this work uh, was, is scientific inquiry a way of asking or a way of answering? And that's something that I'm still sort of deciding for myself. Um, and while this existential crisis was happening, then I also had to think about what is it that I have done as a science communicator uh, in, in these seven years. Um, so I started this work when I was fresh out of a PhD program. I had been in the lab for a good long six years and had very rigorous academic training before that. 
probably like the one that you're undergoing currently. Uh, and then I realized, looking back, I realized that uh, what I had been doing is that thinking about what has happened in the lab and bringing it outside the lab. So science communication for me had always been about this idea of enabling access and breaking barriers. Um, and uh, science, and I don't know if it's true for maths, but I also imagine perhaps maths is perceived as a very institutionalized enterprise. Like you do this in institutes, you do this in labs. These are very physical spaces which have very particular kinds of resources and uh, particular kinds of hierarchies and structures and rules and regulations. Um, and so what I had learned from all this while was from whatever is happening inside the lab. And I wanted to see if I can carry some of this outside the lab. So initially I just started drawing for the sake of drawing. And uh, I made paintings and drawings of natural objects of things that I had seen through the microscope including uh, something like this. This is very uh, sort of loose interpretation of an electron micrograph of a neuron cell. Uh, I don't know if this audience understands electron micrograph or neuron cells. Neuron cells are essentially cells, uh, one particular type of cells inside our brain and electron micrograph for the want of a better word, uh, description is uh, a highly magnified picture taken through a specialized instrument. Uh, so while initially I was just drawing for the sake of drawing, what did happen was that I was able to find an audience. This audience, at least in the beginning, essentially included other PO scientists and um, you know that kind of audience, which means that it was still within the institution and still within the lab. Um, no problem. I mean, one has to start somewhere. And then I started making, you know, these zines. Uh, before I talk more about the zines that I've made, let me just first tell you what are zines. How many of you here are familiar with the idea of zines? I've seen one or made one. Okay, awesome. Uh, do you want to tell us what are zines? Yes. So, um, Zines are essentially self-published, not mega zines. And that's where the word zine also comes from. And also the pronunciation zine comes from as opposed to a zine. Um, right, so the cool thing about zines is that they are self-published, which, which means that you have the liberty to talk about anything you want to talk about. Um, and because I'm a biologist, that's what I wanted to talk about. Um, so this was something that started during my postdoctoral uh, sort of uh, duration. I was lucky enough to speak to educators and other scientists around me who were engaging with students and other audiences with the idea of, you know, what is a cell? How do we regenerate a cell and so on? And one of the things that um, one of the educators told me is that when people think biological cell, I hope you're imagining something. Um, it's often this circle within a circle kind of a diagram, almost like a sunny side up, where the, the smaller circle within the larger circle represents nucleus, which is the part which contains DNA and hereditary material, and the outer circle, which is essentially the physical limit, the outer boundary of this entity. And what I did here was I asked some students around your age who were studying uh, cell and molecular biology as part of their zoology or botany um, education somewhere in University of Delhi. And I asked them to sort of recall and then draw a cell. And this is the kind of things that they drew. Now, one of the, if you look at all of these things together, one of the pattern that really emerges is that most of the people remember the cross section, uh, which is to say, one thin slice view, view through the microscope. That's the view that people remember. This idea that this is actually a 3D entity gets lost. And that's why the people who don't really continually engage with cell biology or that kind of science, remember that circle within a circle cross section and imagine 
uh, and the teenagers who are actually studying this in school because and they have these kinds of diagrams in the textbook actually imagine it as a sunny side up so there was this sort of a misconception around what is the physical form of a cell and um, it so happened that around that time i was also talking to people when i say people this is people who are uh, not uh, scientifically trained who are not experts in sciences the cells that they would remember are uh, red blood cells which is the blood cells and uh, neurons which i mentioned earlier are the cells in the brain and what is interesting is that even if i ask like some of my lawyer friends or you know engineer friends to draw a cell they would also draw that circle within the circle diagram but it's funny because the cell they remember cells they remember neurons or the red blood cells do not look like that circle in cell uh, circle in circle so which means that there was sort of a huge gap between what they remembered and in terms of how the cell looks like and the cell type that they remember um so this led me to sort of make um a couple of zines around cells uh this one is called literally called the form of a cell uh where i thought i came up with a clever metaphor i don't, you can decide whether it's clever enough or not um where i uh sliced an orange orange is a 3d form that we all recognize we have chopped it up and eaten it in different ways so we recognize its vertical cross section horizontal cross section the form on the outside and sliced it along with a single cell uh, organism um, on one side so this is what the slicing up looks like and then at some point uh, yeah so you start to go through layer by layer i do five layers i didn't have the patience to do all the 100 layers um, and <clears throat> this is how it looked like and when i shared it with teachers and some students it did seem to say that maybe the metaphor is working but the cool thing that really happened was that i was then able to bring this work to a public space which happens to be metro station in bangalore so uh, there is this event called indie comics fest which almost happens annually um, i mean pandemic um, you know sort of did disrupt that a little bit and i was able to share it with when i say like young audience of bangalore young adult audience of bangalore and something really cool happened in my conversations with them uh, a lot of them did not necessarily know the names of the forms which maybe is also true for this audience but they were able to spot relationships which i knew were there but were not necessarily my intention so a lot of them through these drawings they were able to say that this thing is always close to the edge and in this particular cell it's actually true that this particular thing which is the energy making organelle called mitochondria is very close to the membrane because it has to power these things that help this organism move um and the other thing that somebody noticed which is not at all intentional is that there was this subtle metaphor that the sort of what is going to carry on from one generation to the other this idea of seed and this idea of the genetic material is somehow landed up on the same section completely unintentional but they were able to sort of come up with a poetic metaphor right there so people even if they don't know uh, things like names and labels can make their own knowledge given the right material and space for it um or at least has been my experience right <clears throat> so the next project that i'll in talk about is uh, this picture book which is essentially the culmination of my postdoctoral work called Actu actually color speak um the intent for making this book really was this idea that we when i say we i mean the scientific community have access to a lot of information knowledge ways of making knowledge that don't necessarily again get outside of the lab or get outside the gates of the institution so in this book we decided that let's find a story where we can tell uh A, a coherent story which is more than the sum of its parts so now color in animals is 
a fairly popular sort of idea, a topic that people know, everybody knows about the chameleon, maybe some of you um, also know about the octopus. And being cell biologists, we also thought about how um, the stories we know are often across a single scale. When I say scale, I mean size. So you either know it at the ecological scale, scale or you know it at the scale of an individual, or you know it at the scale of cell. And we thought, how do about we bring all of that together in co one coherent story that runs across scales? So we go from the individual to the tissue, to the cell, and then even later to the subcellular. It's not here, but uh, it's present in the book. And through that, we talk about three particular animals that show quick color change in responses to external stimuli, and then uh, made this whole color book. Um, and again, with the audience, what happened was we actually made this book thinking teenagers will be our primary audience and the parents of teenagers will be our primary audience. But when the, once the book was out, we realized that apart from teenagers, a lot of preteens were actually reading this book along with their parents. So it became a parent-child exercise for a lot of people because what we managed to do, the power of which we didn't realize while making it, is that a lot of our language is not as complex as a lot of other you know, popular science book work. And in doing that, we made it easier for parents to talk about whatever is happening in the pictures with their kids easy. Um, so these were like some of the ways that uh, been thinking about bringing science outside the lab. Now, uh, another work that I did around the same time was this idea of science talks. You all probably have heard a lot of them and the senior people here have probably given a lot of them. Uh, the barrier that I wanted to break with this project, which we called Science High, was this idea that why only the senior established people get to talk about science in science talks. So Bangalore used to have this thing called uh, Cafe Bangalore or Bangalore Cafe, I don't remember the name, which was run by an institution where the scientists would go to a restaurant or a place like that where they hold events like a Champaka bookstore or a Lai Lai or something like that. And they'll talk about their work. And I was like, I'm equally competent to talk about science with public and my peers equally so. So I created this platform called uh, Science High, where what we used to do was, I would just like force somebody, uh, one of my colleagues and say, okay, hey, you have to give a science talk this month to the public. And we had great friends in this bookstore at, uh, if you are from Bangalore, maybe you know about it, it's called Gubey's Book Republic at Short Street. Um, and we just asked people to come there. We didn't charge anything or, uh, we shifted the bookshelves aside and created makeshift seats and uh, we borrowed a projector and we were, you know, the people would talk there and we would often even have this little science demos. Uh, one of my friends, she brought, he brought Clamidomonas, the organ, uh, cousin of the organism that I was showing you, uh, where, you know, we sh uh, had Clamidomonas culture in a flask. We would uh, shine torchlight and see how it's responding to the light, whether it's moving towards, moving away, and things like that. We did like small, simple demos in Gubey's Book Republic, which is outside of any gated institution. And because it was free, it was also uh, really accessible for anyone who wanted to sign up, show up and sit down. So while we had signups, people would um, you know, come, and, uh, come in for the talks, but we also had cases where people would come in to actually just browse the books or, you know, um, hang out on Church Street during the weekend. So we have that kind of audience as well uh, coming into these talks. And that's when this idea of um, uh, conversing about science in public really sort of um, galvanized more strongly in my head that maybe we need to think more about this. Uh, and then I said, can we do things which are coming from outside the lab to outside the lab and not rely on what is happening within the institutions. Um, so one of the first things that came more easily uh, was this idea of building communities. So through the last uh, maybe four, four months, I've been working with design students 
I mean, they just graduated, so this project, at least for them, is over and not for me. Um, I've been working with design students to uh, again open up the idea of what does it mean to do science and what is a, what does a lab mean. So, like I was referring in my existential crisis zine as to is science a way of asking questions or is science a way of answering questions? So we had said, okay, let's suppose that science is a way of actually asking questions. Um, and I think mathematicians know it better that sometimes you have to wait for a long time before you get to actually solve the problem. And, um, and that still makes it a legit mathematical problem. Uh, so I said, maybe, you know, uh, we change that view and we say that asking questions is what we're calling science. Um, and so we organized a lot of observation walks uh, centered, centered around nature uh, in public spaces like Jakur Lake, Kaban Park, Gonahali Lake, if I'm pronouncing it right. Um, and we invited people to observe with us. And we didn't say, what is it that we are asking you to observe? We, sometimes we had parameters. Sometimes we had open-ended nature to our walks. And then we all of us came together at the end of each walk. and said that, hey, this is what we learned, and this is what I thought about. This is, and each other's wonderment and curiosities sort of helped other people to build their own curiosities. And so we said, like, so, I mean, you could still argue whether that's science or not science, but like we said, like, at least for our framework, we're gonna call it science. And so in that case, the Kaban Park, the Jakur Lake, the Ramgunahali Lake became our labs. And, well, which is true to ecology as well, where they work on the field. And except that we don't get to bring this to a lab and we essentially have to conclude our understanding and asking and answering there. So in one of the works, actually what uh, we were able to do is we asked, uh, we were working with soil and people selected different soil samples from uh, the same site, Kaban Park, but different sort of micro locations. And uh, some soil was wet and some soil was dry. And then we, just generally wondered, can we figure out a way to measure this wetness at this point of time? And uh, believe it or not, uh, audience was able to uh, sort of devise really cool, interesting ways to think about how to do it. So we didn't have a lot of stuff like, and definitely no sort of scientific instruments. So we had cello tape, um, we had tissue paper, and we had regular paper. So we said, okay, can we take the cello tape and try to stick the soil uh, on the tape? The logic being, if the soil is wet, it will not stick as well to the cello tape. And if the soil is dry, maybe it'll stick better to the cello tape. And then we try to sort of look to a light source with that cello tape as a variant and then photograph it. It had its limitations, it did not work out, but like we, from this idea of observation and documentation and asking, we were able to just make a nudge towards this idea of measurement as well, even if it was, you know, done with what I would say, jugard ways. The other idea we came up with was like, let's put like a spoonful of soil. We didn't have weighing machines. We said, okay, this spoon is our measurement unit. And this is all not our doing. This is what the audience sort of came up with together. And we'll, put equal amounts of sort of soil based on this spoon and then put tissue paper on it and put some heavy book on it and then see where is the more sort of, we can see the wetness in the tissue paper and see from that spread decide, okay, which one is a wetter soil and which one is a drier soil. So what I'm trying to say is that if we give community the space, then there is a possibility of thinking about things or asking questions in a fairly scientific manner. And uh, that's what I'm hoping to do in the time to come where I will be able to build these communities and bridge them together where they can support each other's asking and maybe answering in um, time to come. Right. Um, so some of the work, again, on reflection one realizes has also been, now that I've been away from academia or at least hardcore pipetting academia for a while, um, is that I have a bit of an outsider's perspective also, and especially as a science communicator, because I talk to a lot more non-scientists than scientists. Earlier, it would mean that I'm having chai with my peers who are all scientists, but now I would have chai with peers who are not at all scientists or probably don't even care about science. Um, so 
what I'm able to do with them is that me being outside with them, uh, outside the lab with them, can, through my experience, give them a glimpse of what's happening inside the lab. Uh, I, like you heard that I work at Srishti Manipal Institute, which is an art and design school, which means I get to work with fabulous art and design students. Um, and what I've been able to do is I've designed my courses in a way which luckily uh, my institute gives me the freedom to do is um, bring science into the conversation. So, you know, from one of my courses, what I did was literally shouted out on Twitter that, hey, I want my students to talk to sci uh, scientists for this particular course. Uh, whoever scientists are interested, please sign up. And I did have a lot of people sign up. And then I set up a whole day of engagement with scientists where my students got to interact one-on-one -on -one with some particular scientists. And for students, it was a very different experience because A, they thought, oh, scientists are such like so cool, so far away, distant planets. How, why are they giving time to us? How are they giving time to us? And for them, it felt like a privilege. But then after talking to them, they also realized that they are also humans. They also laugh. They also talk about silly things. They sometimes stumble when they are walking, uh, sorry, talking. And <laughs> see, I did that just now. <laughs> and, uh, and that they were actually able to converse with them despite the fact that they don't actually come from sciences, uh, which they thought that would be a challenge for them. Um, and I've been able to also take them to science museums and herbariums and whatever the city offers uh, and try to build that within sort of the pedagog pedagogical framework of my teaching. Um, the other idea that uh, sort of emerged from all of these conversations around bringing science to public spaces is like, why should even public care? Like, why should they care about science? And um, uh, the timer is not started, by the way, <laughs> which is fine. Uh, I'm good with time, very good with time. Um, so this idea of measuring public perception of science led to sort of introspection, both at an individual level and then at a Google form level, because that's the best surveying form I know now or is possible for me now, though it's legit not the best way to think about it. Um, and uh, after sort of collecting a lot of this data about what do people think about science, uh, what do they think about the relationship between science and religion? What do they think about the relationship between science and technology? What do they think about relationship with science and culture? That's not how we literally phrase the question, but like these were the ideas that we were asking people. And then based on that, we created uh, a bunch of data visualization charts and a lot of other engagements that we presented at this event called the India Science Festival um, at Hyderabad this year. And so, there the conversation happened at two levels. One, we sent out the form uh, and we were actually accepting data only from people who don't have uh, scientific training. So we were literally measuring the public perception, except that it being a Google form had its limitation because if I send out a Google form, it is my immediate network or maybe my secondary network that's going to be accessing it from. So it's Ipsa's public perception of science and it's not India's public perception of science. Um, so it has its limitation, but it did tell us something, uh, some really cool things like when people think about uh, uh, science and religion in India, at least people are able to uh, be very scientific in other ways of thinking, but also say, call themselves religious or at least fairly religious. And they don't necessarily see as a dichotomy that some of the hardcore scientists somehow sometimes tend to do, so which is, which I think speaks for the cultural diversity that India has. and. As science communicators, we just need to accept and respect it and keep that as a grounding and then build our work layered on that. Right. Uh, now, this one is quite literal where me having the privileges of understanding how lab works and still having some foot in the door just because of my network. Um, <clears throat> I've done some work around how are experiments done? So when, if you Google about like how to make a mutant fly or how to make a mutant crop, you will get a list of uh, protocol that probably means a zoot to you if you don't know that kind of language. So I wrote this one particular experiment in a human first language. So think about, if we think about science as a craft, which is what I tend to do sometimes, where especially 
you know, in the kind of sciences that I've been doing. So there is, there is hand that's involved. And I mean, apart from the mind, of course, which is involved in thinking and asking, there's a the handwork, there is uh, some skills that you learn, which you learn to be like intuitively with practice, they become sort of intuitive habits. And so I wanted to document that craft nature of doing and performing science and wrote a protocol in a very human first language. And then again, I presented this at the Indie Comics Fest and I actually don't have a copy of it because it's sold out. <clears throat> Because people want to know how to make mutants. I mean, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I have had people asking me, can you make a mutant for us? Like, and I'm like, that's not how it works, you know? Like, so, uh, so through do, doing, uh, like, writing a zine like this, it kind of did help share the complexities of her and limitations of a process like that and the idea of failure. So, one of the things that we don't do as science communicators is sharing this idea of uncertainty that how what we know has a certain degree of uncertainty, but this is our best guess possible at this point of time. And uh, that's something that I'm again trying to do, um, you know, in this work. Um, yeah, and uh, by this idea of taking science from outside, inside the lab to outside the lab, and then providing a window for people outside the lab to what's happening inside the lab, being a closer loop, or at least I'm trying to close a loop by saying that science is for everyone and just does not belong in the lab or an institution. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for your attention. I would really like this to be interactive. So I have a bunch of my work here. You can come and look at it here. You can take it to your place. And I'm happy to take questions or talk about any other project in any project in detail if there was something that resonated with you or clicked with you. Yeah, thank you.